My dear friends, our scripture passage today is a little bit different from what you see in the bulletin today. I want us to turn to the New Testament letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, Colossians chapter 3. This being Labor Day weekend, I'd like for us to think about the labor that God is calling us to engage in as a community of faith. And so I invite you to look with me at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, do it from the heart for the Lord and not for people. Whatever you do, do it from the heart for the Lord and not for the people. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Nothing like changes at the last minute, right? <laughs> On this Labor Day weekend, many of us want to rest from our labors. We don't want to have to work, and so I had planned to go to the lake today and rest from my labors. But I am truly glad to be here among you as we serve God together with hearts and minds and spirits. On this Labor Day weekend, I did think about an old story that I heard many years ago about a man named Smith. He died and he re, um, regained his consciousness once he was in eternity. And he looked around over a vast expanse of beautiful countryside. After resting comfortably for a little while in a delightful spot, he cried out, Is anybody else here? And an attendant dressed in white immediately came to his side and said gravely, What do you want? And Smith asked, Well, what can I have? And the attendant replied, well, you can have anything you want. And so Smith named some of his favorite foods, and immediately all of his favorite foods were brought out on a beautiful tray, and they all tasted delicious. And so next he asked for some games to play and directions to the golf course. And games were brought out, and he played, and he had fun. And all of his putts went straight in. He had a wonderful golf game. It was fantastic. And then he asked for some books that he had not had time to read on his time on earth. And he read and he slept and he read and he slept and he read and he slept. And it was great. But eventually he got kind of bored with all of that relaxing and he shouted out, Attended, attended, I need something to do. And the attendant appeared and said, Oh, I'm sorry. That's the one thing I cannot give you. Smith became very frantic, and he said in frustration, But I'm miserable without anything to do. And the attendant said, Well, I'm sorry, but I can't give you anything to do. And Smith said, I'd rather be in hell than not have anything to do. And the attendant said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you knew. That's exactly where you are. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Some of you might be thinking, if hell's like that, I might spend a few days there. But my friends, we were made for work. God has blessed our work. God has blessed each one of us to do God's work, to be God's hands at work in this world. We are called the body of Christ for a reason. We are to do God's work in the here and now. The Bible itself is a pro-work document, my friends. You see, when Adam and Eve were first in the garden, God gave them work to do. 
Work is not the result of sin. Work was given to them to do from the very beginning. They were to care for and tend the garden. It only became toilsome and difficult after sin entered into the world. Presumably, the angels in heaven also have work to do. That's why Gabriel was sent as a messenger. There is always work to do, and work in itself is good, my friends. St. Paul, in this letter to the Colossians, said to them, Whatever you do, do it with your heart for the Lord, not for people the work that we do is not for ourselves and for our own glory. It is for the glory of God and for the bidding of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The work that we do with our hands should be done with excellence, my friends. All of the work that we do and everything that we put into our hands should be used to build up God's kingdom, it should be used wisely. It should be used for the benefit of others. The hand that reaches out to give aid to another one in caring and in loving a life, the hand that reaches out to touch others with greeting and with friendship can also save a life from loneliness and despair. We receive into our hands things that we are to hold and to give in service to others. That's part of receiving our tithes and offerings, using our hands to share our blessings with others, to reach out. The things that our hands can write whether they are in emails or text messages or written manuscripts, letters or postcards, have the power to heal and the power to inflict pain. Our hands are very powerful, my friends. Powerful instruments to do the work of God in this kingdom. In the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalm 90, we read a prayer to God. The prayer goes like this. Prosper for us the work of our hands, or prosper the work of our hands. The writer of that psalm is asking God to bless all of the work of our hands, to make our work meaningful, to make our work matter and make a difference in this world, to make our work have lasting impacts to benefit others. And in asking God to prosper the work of our hands, the psalmist is acknowledging that we can be used by God to do God's work in meaningful ways to do the works of love and justice and mercy in this world. God blesses our hands so that we can be God's hands in this world. There is a hymn that is often associated with Billy Graham and probably more so with our Baptist brothers and sisters that was written by Charlotte Elliott. Charlotte Elliott was born in England in 1789, and she led a pretty normal life until she was about 30 years old when she became very ill and debilitated. She became so sickly that she was bedridden for the rest of her life. With her failing health, she became very despondent and aching, to just die, thinking that she had nothing to contribute to life anymore. But in 1822, when she was 33 years of age, a popular evangelist named Dr. Caesar Milan came to visit Charlotte in her home. And during that visit, he told her that even though she was sickly and bedridden, the Lord would take her just as she was. 
That made a very great impression upon Charlotte Elliott. She considered his words to be a vital influence on what she considered her conversion, her conversion in a deeper and more meaningful faith in Jesus Christ. And for many years, she contemplated those words that he shared with her, that God accepted her just as she was. In fact, she contemplated it for 14 years. And then finally, she was moved to write down the words in 1836 that became a hymn known by its famous title, Just As I Am. Though Charlotte lived to be 82 years of age, she never regained her health. She once wrote of her afflictions, God knows and God alone what it is to fight this overpowering weakness and exhaustion and not give in to slothfulness, depression, or instability. But God has accepted me just as I am and has work for me to do. The text of the hymn, Just As I Am, was published in a book of other hymns that she wrote in hopes that she might garner enough money to help her brother, who was a pastor and who had children to raise and who was ministering to children in a poor school in England. Charlotte had always felt so helpless in her life that she thought by this one effort of writing these poems and to hymns and publishing them, the words and the music from her life and her relationship with God in Jesus Christ might impact others and help her brother and those children. Interestingly enough, that one hymn, Just As I Am, out of 115 that were published in that book, brought in more funds than her brother's bazaars or projects or anything else he tried to do to raise money for those children. Her brother praised his sister highly and amazed her labor and her fruitfulness. She did what she could with the hands that God gave her. And after she died, among her effects was found thousands of letters from individuals all over the world expressing testimonials about what that one hymn meant in their lives. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict and many a doubt, fighting the fears within and without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Charlotte's stories is only one of thousands of stories of people who have labored through the centuries to share the good news of God's grace, God's love, and to do the work of God's justice and peace to bring healing and hope into the world laboring as the body of Christ in a world, allowing the light of Christ to shine through us and touch others in meaningful ways. Once we accept Christ into our lives, my friends, we are each called to use our hearts and our hands in service to building up God's kingdom, to be instruments of God, to do God's work here and now. But it takes a willingness on our part, a willingness to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Just as Austin had prepared to preach to us today about Moses' call and Moses saying, but Lord, who am I that you would call me to serve? I stutter, I can't do it. We often have many excuses for why we cannot serve or feeling that we are not equipped to use our hands to make a difference in this world. But let me tell you, 
Antonio Stradivari lived a long time ago, as you know. But even now, people both inside and outside of music circles are familiar with his name and the fame of his violins. He is reported to have said, when any master holds twitched chin and hand a violin of mine, he will be glad that Stradivari lived, lived and made violins and made them the best. God choosing me to help him. If my hand slacked in making these violins, I would have robbed God since God could not make Antonio's violins without Antonio. Did you get that? We are God's hands. God is not able or willing to accomplish the beauty, the peace, the justice, the healing in this world right now because God has chosen to use you and to use me. For God's beauty to take place in this world, when our hand is nearest to someone in need, God says, are you willing to use what I've given you to do my work and help out that neighbor in need? The hands of each Christian should express the touch of Christ. For Christ specialized in touching people in personal and deep ways. Jesus himself portrayed God as the giver ready to help us. And we are called to help others. And I know we get tired and we get busy and we get distracted and we get frustrated. But God has promised to give us the help we need to do the work that God has called us to do. With hands outstretched and palms lifted upward, Christ reached out in love to embrace each one of us. And we come to a table today with hands outstretched and palms lifted up to receive the bread that will nourish and strengthen us, to receive the cup of life that will fill us and sustain us, to be reminded that Christ's presence meets us where we have needs, to give us the grace and the strength that we need to be the hands that we are called to be here and now. This sacrament that we are about to share, my friends, is not a reminder of the gift of God. It is the gift. It is the gift that reminds us that God is real and God is with us to sustain us and that God has called us to do God's work in this world so that our hands might be ready to reach out and touch others with the love and the grace that we have received. When we take that bread into our hands and into our bodies, we fill ourselves so that we can go out into the world strengthened and sustained and remember that we do not go alone. May we prepare our hearts now to receive the gift of grace and love and forgiveness that we need and the strength and the courage to be God's hands in this world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.